So welcome everyone to this panel. Uh, today we're speaking with a couple mutual aid uh, facilitators and organizers in the community. Um, this program is put together by 8-Ball Community, uh, a multimedia um, access point for interdisciplinary um, artists and youth. It's based in the East Village and um, has been around for many years. If you've been to a zine fair in a billiard hall, you probably are familiar. Um, today with us on the panel, we have Brian Villalobos, a general manager at Public Assistance, a mutual aid network um, and resistance hub, as well as a design lab in Crown Heights um, that creates community for people of all kinds in Brooklyn. We also have Isaac Miller, um, an unemployed barista and organizer with Friend of a Friend. He's honored to be here and share this space as well as um, tell us a little bit about his organization. He's really excited to learn new ways to connect with and empower communities. And um, last but not least, there's Zanat Begum, the founder of Playground Coffee Shop and Playground Youth a community-based organization focused on providing accessible programming on food equity, arts, and literacy, also based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my name is Naomi Lawrence. You can call me Sachi. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be facilitating the conversation today. So I think that we should get started by just, just telling you how you, how you feel you know? about um, your work and what drives you personally, like what kind of got you interested in in mutual aid work? And what ways does your identity shape, you know, your relationship to mutual aid? Uh, I was unmuted, so I'll begin, I guess. Yeah, cool. All right, yeah, um, I guess, I mean, uh, personally, I'm very new to mutual aid. So it is, it's been a process of um, self-discovery as well. Uh, I think I was dealing a lot earlier with, um, you know, feelings of guilt and, uh, you know, uh, not being useful or useless and these weird metrics that uh, was very much torturesome up here. Um, but I think just um, becoming, uh, I guess, more, yeah, more involved in uh, the community I've been involved with um, and just like the simple joys and uh, the simple things I've been able to help um, create with that community have really alleviated a lot of that tension and also pushed me to um, kind of, uh, yeah, not focus too much on my ego and just um, be clear and honest with how I can serve a community and uh, how I can, how much I can honestly do. Um, yeah, so it's been really exciting and um, I'm excited for what more I discover about myself personally. Zanat. Oh, hey, thanks for having me. And also so excited to be a part of this panel. Um, I don't know. I feel like, you know, the, the definition of mutual aid, I feel like is something so new to me, you know, in the work that I've been doing for the last five years, I've always been doing mutual aid. You know, I kind of also started doing mutual aid through um, like programs in high school and then working at eight ball, like right after college was really important. And I think like most, one of the most pivotal times in which I understood the power of community and, you know, getting people to help you with your art show, or even a drive that you wanted to do, or even facilitating an art book fair at, you know, MoMA PS1. Um, it's kind of like the driving force of being able to work collectively, which is, you know, looking out for one of one another. And I think this year was very, um, was very eye opening. And I think a lot of discoveries, you know, how you say Isaac about yourself have been really importantly made within our own communities. I think that like me realizing what my community members needed more than anything was really important to me because if my community is not right, then I'm not either, you know, and I think these people are who surround our, our community are so important in which they help us just like have a better understanding of how we can do better. And just being able to now do mutual aid and like have that as like, I guess, like a job title um, 
it kind of feels weird. And you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like the, this aspect of guilt, like why is it that I all of a sudden am the pioneer of mutual aid? Um, but it's really beautiful to see how many of my friends now this year have gotten involved because of this. So, you know, of course there is this nuance of what mutual aid is, but I also think that ultimately we need to get everyone engaged. So we're stepping in the right direction. And I think that's what I'm hopefully, you know, through my job advocating for. Um, I mean, I think what drives me is just making sure that like those around me and myself are being taken care of and like supported mentally and emotionally, um, whether it's like checking in or like spending time with someone or like working on a project together or like even giving them space. Um, I think mental health is such an important um, aspect of all of our lives, especially in mutual aid, um, because it can often be like um, looked over, like set aside because we're so continuously working to serve our communities. And I think it's really important to take care of ourselves and our like immediate community to better serve our extended community. Heard. I think that all of those points are super valid and that kind of leads into the next question. Um, you know, with your personal understandings of, you know, how to meet needs in your community and within yourself and within your friend group. Um, how did that shift into your organization and, and, you know, what seeds were planted through your personal ideas that kind of facilitated this mission and how has it evolved? For myself, I think think for the last five years, I've been one of those people who are just like, hey, let's hang out at the coffee shop and do something together. I think that it's a point of inviting people. Um, you know, as much as I want to engage my community, I also want to engage my friends and be able to offer challenging points that can make us work harder and collectively smarter too for people around us. And I think that the idea of behind collective organizing is so important within my friend structure now where I feel like I, I think it's an and I have an amazing amount of privilege to be able to work with my friends every day. And I think that's something that I've seen at Public Assistance and at April, even through you, Sachi, like this, this summer was really difficult for me in organizing. And I kind of thought that I was losing my mind a little bit. Um, and finding this like incredible amount of imbalance in my life, I had friends reach out to me and tell me that, you know, you know, you're held, we're taking care of you. How can I be of assistance to you? And I feel like, you know, just like, I'm just so grateful for someone like you too, just being able to like check in on me and making sure that, of course, the engine of mutual aid is like oiled, but like it's ultimately those people that come together that create mutual aid, right? And so like, if we're not good, how do we then take care of this entire community that we now have put on our back, right? And it's just like so eye-opening to be able to work with your friends effectively and have each of them have a skill and a, and a role to be able to divisively and didactically show people how to do things with a plan. Because, you know, with government agencies failing us this year, the biggest, you know, common misconception about youth and people who are organizing is that they can't do it effectively and that they can't do it in the best way and that they don't know what they're doing. And I think this year showed everybody more than anything that we have a plan and we always have had a plan. And I think that when times like, you know, injustice and is also just like, you know, where marginalized communities are being hit by a pandemic that is only affecting brown and black people disproportionately, you know, it makes me think that like, we have to have a plan period. And this is just the manifestation of these plans. So we're finally putting in the world, the, you know, just like the, the tools that we've learned these last few years in seeing this administration just kind of like blow up um, and now actually using them. So it's, it's really amazing to be able to do that. So, yeah. Now, that's a great point, Sana. You know, I think that you raising the concept of caring for the caregivers and organizers is critical because, you know, to maintain this work, and this is a conversation we've had, you know, a few times when we discuss, you know, our family structures or cultural, you know, inclinations towards caregiving as a community. Um, Brian, I also feel that way completely about your work and, and the, the kinship that I've witnessed at Public Assistance is so moving. I'm just like so excited to bear witness and support um, your group for that reason. Um, how has your mission evolved from that like beginning space? I mean, watching 
everything that you've done in that space is incredible. I want you to talk a little bit about that. Um, I think our mission has evolved in a way like it just I mean it it just changes every day just like we do I think um, together we kind of just like we take on we take every day as like as it comes like there's not there's not a lot of planning happening in this in the way of like you know we are, we're not expecting to like do certain things it's just like things come up and we're like okay let's take it on and like we just take it head on and like I think that is so important in a way because um it's just I think the way you approach it is more genuine and more honest and more like you're not second guessing yourself because you're just trying you're just pushing to move forward and like to solve a problem in front of you yeah Yeah, absolutely and and Isaac through your work in front of a friend I mean that was the the initial concept right it was like moving to my understanding the birthplace of your group was was moving materials from occupy right can you talk a little bit about that yeah um uh first i want to sh- uh, shout out what z said about uh, didactically uh, that that word stuck out to me because i think yeah what i'm learning more and more is so many people um need need kind of rules or guidance and it's like not just encouragement it's like a mixture like you don't want to just like slot people in but like so many people are so new to this myself included that like before this started I was just constantly like I signed up for a bunch of mutual aid things that were attached to some politician like no one got back to me because they're probably flooded with like folks that were just desperate to do something but had no idea that they could or what to do um but yeah, sorry, back to the question. Um, yeah, we came out of the city hall protests um, after one of the public meetings. Um, uh, a person there was like, hey, I've noticed there's a lot of resources, like if folks want to get together to figure out how to make sure that like um, these don't just like go to waste and get out to the community, please like, uh, yeah, just tap me once we're done here. and. Uh, then like me and like Jason and Dana were there and we were all kind of waiting. We're like, cool, what do we do? And she was like, oh, you wanted to do that? Okay, do it. And then we like waited for like five minutes or like a minute probably seemed like a long time. And then we just started gathering stuff, asking around for um, stuff that was just gonna go to waste Um, and immediately like just encountering, yeah, so much, positive encouragement or like the the, like the need was definitely there for that but like no one had just like stepped in to do that and you know uh so yeah we we wanted to make sure uh members of the community uh who maybe were scared off from the protest because it was hyper surveilled even like there was intense amount of cops even for you know that area um, we wanted to make sure they were taken care of as well. So we just um, headed out uh, to distribute what the just flood of resources that were coming through those first couple weeks. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? That's where we came from. Yeah, I think so. But but since then, and you can take this into the next one, um, your mission has kind of evolved to just dispersing resources through those communities, those same communities you were serving back in, you know, what is it, September? Yeah, yeah, I believe it was like July or June when we started. And then um, we would source stuff in the area, food and stuff and like utensils and anything we can get our hands on. And then we started sourcing our own cooks when the resources at the camp started to dwindle, um, which was an odd dynamic. But um, anyway, yeah, we started, we sourced our own stuff. We started an Instagram page, um, got a lot of donations. We're we're in a pretty good place now, even though winter has um, uh, taken a chunk of our funding because we're like, we're trying to make sure the community is as hooked up as they can. But yeah, we're, we're always going to be short, I feel, or like the thing our community needs so much is just housing Mm -hmm. is the thing. And, um, uh, it's really hard not being able to provide that, you know, but again, like we've done, we found ways to like advocate for different community members to, 
to um, we found time to just like walk them through these Byzantine processes that like nonprofits um, uh, put up to get housing, which, you know, they have to because there's I don't yeah, I'm not trying to shit on anybody. Um, but like, it is a pretty disheartening process that a lot of community members, like, just get tired of. And so we've been able to um, plug in for certain members, we're trying to develop the organizational capacity to do that more frequently. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it started started pretty simple. And now we're just yeah, finding, finding ways to serve uh, as many of the needs of that community as we can. Now, Brian, I feel like public assistance began that way with a kind of mission to create space and hold space for people um, in your community and now has evolved to be such a resource um, through different initiatives. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of those things? Yeah, I mean, public assistance, I mean, it was, we, it was an abandoned, um, laundromat and like pawn shop and like methadone clinic and like somehow um don christian acquired the keys and like we've just been working out of that space ever since and um now we have i mean we have our community fridge we have our bike initiative which has been really like a huge success um we've given out like i think over 40 bikes to um cutie bipoc in the neighborhood and just like all around new york and we have several more bikes to give out um yeah i mean it's just it's 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 really just like you can come and do anything there there's no pressure to work um there's no pressure to do anything like if you want to come there and just hang out and rest like that's completely fine like it's just we we really wanted to just create a safe space for people for especially for queer people um just because i feel like as queer people and as people of color like a lot of the um, institutions that we've come from are like inherently white supremacist and like we don't ever feel welcome there and we don't ever feel comfortable and this is I think this is the first time we've ever seen something like this where it's like a space where you can come and create whatever you want and feel comfortable about doing it and it's like people doing it for themselves and like everyone there is there to help you. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I was so excited when you opened because it does have, it does mirror threads of the beginnings of 8-Ball um, and, and what that organization provided for me was so wonderful just in terms of being able to relate to other people who, who have, who share similar values, you know. Um, that's how I met Zanat. And um, yeah, we'll take this panel, but you know, I think Zanat has gone off and branched off to begin her own initiative, which has taken such a beautiful shape. And I, I really want you to talk a little bit about what Playground is doing um, and the way that it's grown. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> so I started Playground after I left 8-Ball. I was so devastated because I thought that, you know, I had to get a real job and I was like, working these really odd jobs while I was working at 8-Ball. I was like babysitting. I was working like at a bakery part-time and I was like just trying to make ends meet because I wanted to work at 8-Ball so much and like actually make it something that I kind of wanted to like branch off from because I, I was kind of insecure about my future just because, you know, like I had an economics degree and I have a degree in Chinese and history, which is like on paper, you can be like an economist or like a financial analyst. And like, I would never be able to get those jobs period. Like I would never even make it into the interview round. And I've had that experience firsthand where people, you know, like they see my resume and they're like, cool, let's invite you in. And then see me and they're like, whoa, you're a woman. And it would just like, or like you're a person of color. Oh, that's crazy. I don't know how to pronounce your name, you know? And I'm just like, I was so confused. Cause I'm like, you know, I did what I had to do. Like I got this degree that like my, like my parents had to like work their asses off to help me for, And like, I had to get scholarships and it just didn't make sense, you know? And then finally, when I was, when I returned back to, you know, home after like being in college for the last four years, mentally, I was just like so exhausted because I didn't know what to do. And I had spent the year in Amsterdam before I spent my last, my third year of college there on an exchange program. Um, so they switched someone out from my school for me to go there. And so 
I used to work at this place called the Frankreich, which is the squatter home in the middle of the city. And everybody that lived there was a musician. They were a cook. They uh, were a filmmaker. We had movie nights. We had concerts. I mean, like, I've seen this place be a dinner, a club, uh, sorry, um, a, like a luncheonette, a cafe, a club, but also like a healing circle. And it just made so much sense for me. I was like, where can I find something like this in New York? And it started to dawn on me that there really was nothing like it, you know? And when when I entered the space of 8-Ball, you know, very transient space, went from being in Brooklyn to Chinatown, back to Brooklyn, but then now, then in Queens. And then it just kind of sh took shape wherever it went. And, you know, being a New Yorker and also like having an experience of like being housing insecure and going through housing crises and stuff like that with your parents, it made me scared because I was like, not only am I not you know, guaranteed housing, but I also don't have job security. Um, and at the time, my parents were losing their hardware store because Home Depot was opening up. Their rent had just skyrocketed and my dad made the decision to close his business. And he'd already been subletting it at least to like this this uh, this bar next door. And they were like relatively cool people. And I was like, you know, like, man, like these people are just, all these people are white. And like, this sucks. Like what's going to happen to this space? And I freaked out and I was like, look, dad, I'm going to come up with a plan. I'm going to try to save this corner. And so then I got all of my friends want to help me create the sign. I got someone to help me clear the shop out. I got someone to help me buy chairs, look for signage, like everything on under the sun was covered. And I think my parents were like, oh shit, this person has a plan, you know? And so then we sold back most of his materials. And then I took out this huge loan to make playground. And I was really scared, you know, opening it up as a business, but then you have to create like an INC, you have to like register your name. And I started seeing my, my, my name on like official documents that were attached to this business and it totally freaked me out, you know? And so I wanted it to be something more than this. I wanted it to be more than a business and, you know, kind of continue the legacy of my parents because they had a hardware store for 20 years, you know, that fully supported my family and then some, and then, you know, also communities back home because when you're an immigrant, the job is as a person who comes to America is to be this bank account for everybody back home. So not only did my parents' you know, income help support my family, but also probably like 20 to 40 other people that we will never meet. Um, and that's the, that's the point of this, you know, is to be able to have, be a support system. And so it, it occurred to me that I wanted to make it a community space and I wanted it to be a gallery, but I also wanted it to be a pit for a hardcore show, but they also wanted it to be a radio station. You know, it's just like, Everything came so naturally because I wanted to see my space evolve. And then, you know, right before COVID, I remember one day just looking up and seeing a live radio show while we were having a sliding scale brunch for BIPOC people. And then we were, our restaurant was completely full. It just made me so, and, and we also had a drive going on that day too. It just seeing the shop in full motion made me just so happy because something like this didn't have, didn't really exist before I created it. And I think just being able to know that like, I created this place for my friends and I to just like celebrate ourselves was probably one of the most just like life-changing things. And I think that that's what I'm committed to. And we're entering our fifth year of being open, which is half a decade. And this is the longest job I've ever had in my life. So, <laughs> um, and I can't even call it a job just because I love to do what I do. And like, I, I know that's really corny, but like literally this job changed my life because it showed me that there's more to life than just like fucking running a check, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, that's my story, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely incredible because this is truly tying key parts of your identity into it, weaving them into your future and kind of spreading those um, resources as far as you can. I think that dedication is really intensely admirable and I'm so in awe of, of you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how the pandemic has shaped each of you and your relationship to your work. You know, how were you personally impacted by the pandemic, but also how has that changed your work? I know for me, I was out of work. Um, I'm I'm a cook. You know, I've I was out of work um, at the beginning of this, and I I think that that kind of compelled me to dedicate myself to just like going headfirst into this type of like if there's nothing else that will offer me support and satisfaction, I think it's just the idea that I'm able to serve other people that's really critical in how I operate. Um, but 
but to be to have nothing and then also want to give away everything I think is something that's a common thread between all of us um and I want I want each of you to talk a little bit about that impact of the pandemic and and what it feels like to be so active in mutual aid while also not really coming from a place of like we're not I don't know I don't know are we proper um altruists or philanthropists we're penny pinching philanthropists right I mean isn't that kind of I, that blows my mind every day to think about that I want each of you to talk about your experience who wants to go first first um I I mean I work as a bartender um and since the pandemic hit it went like the bar shut down so I was out of work um and then during like all the civil unrest like uprising that's kind of where PA was born and like it came out of that like it was just like it was born out of necessity and like I mean we like to say like um they're called uh sorry <laughs> i got lost for a second um necessity is um sorry uh, is the mother of invention yes necessity is the mother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my notes <laughs> um necessity is the mother of invention and public assistance is his daughter um but yeah, I mean, ever since I started going to public assistance, I really just like, I've grown and learned so much. I feel like I found family there, which to me is so important just because as a queer person, like family, especially like being from um, an immigrant family and being first generation, like my parents are very, they don't, they don't understand me or my lifestyle really. And they're just, some, you know, some of them try, like one of them tries, the other one doesn't really try. And like, it's just, you know, like you really rely on your found family. And when I found PA, I like immediately was just, I couldn't stop going there. I just would show up every day. And, and like Sanat said, like, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like work because you love everyone you're with and like all the work you're doing, it just doesn't feel like work. It literally just feels like you're hanging out with your friends and like you're doing amazing things. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I. I love it there so much. It's really a place where you can come and like, if you can dream it, like we're gonna do everything in our power to make it a reality, which I think that level of support and encouragement, I don't think I've ever had in my life. And it's really changed and like changed me. And like, just, I believe in myself so much more because of this. Um, and I think that is really great because it's like, if you can believe in yourself, like imagine like what that impact has on other people. Um, yeah. I've not heard a lot about the um, interpersonal connections at friend of a friend, though I do know a few, a few of the members, um, including you, and I really enjoy spending time with you, Isaac, you know, can you talk a little bit about, about the shape your work has taken because of the pandemic? I mean, it friend of a friend didn't exist prior to this no. epidemic, did it? No, it did not. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, pandemic was the mother of uh, our invention. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess like my, my journey uh, to it was, yeah, pandemic kind of uh, put my life, I don't know, I feel like it kind of ended uh in a not to be super gloomy but yeah my life as I understood it like completely ended with pandemic I was doing uh theater um I was working as a barista and as like a after school arts person though neither of those jobs I, I love those jobs because I could just uh show up do the hours and then completely get rid of it to do stuff I like enjoyed doing um, which, you know, if I ever were to return, I think I'd be a little more thoughtful about um, even just the, the work environment and um, taking some of the organizing skills I've learned with friend of a friend into that space. Um, but yeah, uh, I was just on a big pause for pandemic. And then, yeah, the uprising started and I started, um, I was like out pretty much every day at a different thing and it felt it was really exciting it felt like um 
we're on the edge of something. And even though I couldn't describe it, it was still like there was um, a very uh, a good energy um, in the air. Uh, and uh, but I found that like I wasn't that when I'd go home, I would kind of um, not crash, but it would be like, like, what actually am I doing? Right. Am I just going to these things? Um, I tried to be as useful as I could as, um, you know, protective as I could out there and be smart about it. But I, it was still like, I have, I still have like just loads of hours <laughs> just on my hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I put, I started to put a lot of that into friend of a friend and, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, interpersonally, it was, it was a cool, it was a cool experience because uh, we're, we, uh, we're all pretty casual. <laughs> we're all pretty like go, go along to get along people, but they're like sparks of inspiration that we're, like, as soon as someone mentions an idea, for the most part, we're all just like, yes, let's pursue that. Let's do that as hard as it can. And like, that's um, allowed me to be way more um, forward, not not even forward. Cause it's like just little nascent ideas I would have that would be like, no, that's stupid. Or like, that's, we can't do that. Like just being in an environment where it's like, well, what is our mission? What are we doing? Um, how do we pursue that? It's just made it a lot easier to be like, okay, I've got someone's ear and we've made everything else work up to this point. So why don't we at least, I can voice this and trust that it'll be in a, a you know, a, a nurturing environment. Um, so yeah, I think pandemic just gave me, um, yeah, reoriented a lot and helped me better align with my principles, you know, and it's still a process. Um, but, uh, it's been, yeah, it's been a process will be a process. That's such an interesting common thread. Um, that idea, that concept of found family, chosen family, and then that newfound support from intentional relationships kind of pushing forward all of these um, ideas and projects, like the fact that you can voice an opinion and feel heard, you know, is, is crucial. And I think that so many people don't realize how much or how far that can go, you know, feeling supported, feeling empowered, which is not a lot of, which is not allowed to, to many of us, given our intersectional, you know, intersectionally marginalized identities, you know, Zana, I think that Playground has offered that to quite a, a few people. And the work that Playground Youth is doing is exactly that, right? Yeah, it's like, you know, we, we've been doing this work for five years and I was like, damn, no one really cares about mutual aid. And then like the pandemic occurred and then, you know, everybody's like, oh, cool, like you're useful. So it's kind of hard to like run through a business model that isn't really like regular day proof, but it's COVID proof, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think ultimately like during COVID, you know, to Brian's point, assembling during like the height of the, the protests. So like March was mm -hmm. March and April were very static energy for me. I was working behind the bar. I haven't stopped working since the pandemic started. So I remember I was on a plane like the weekend before COVID hit New York and like we were in complete shot like lockdown. And then from that point to probably February 1st, I was working every day. Um, and I mean, like organizing with the protests, like May 31st was the first protest at Barclays. And then, then to June, uh, to July, I think mid-July, we were going to every protest. We were doing jail support. We were showing up to um, rallies, just making sure people had masks on because, you know, this is also at the same time where the rhetoric rises of like, oh, people who are protesting are trying to get sick or like actively spreading coronavirus. Like we're super spreaders, um, which actually turned out to be false because there were so many resources and so many people showing up to these protests that actually the, the protests actually had no like causation or correlation to the rise of coronavirus in New York City. So that's pretty remarkable. And then we go back into a time of community fridges. Uh, my friend had a community fridge idea and I was like, boom, let's do it. And then we put one at public assistance. We put one in front of Playground Coffee Shop. We put one in front of Sincerely Tommy. We have one in front of Hair Metal. And we have one in front of uh, a, this 
Oh my God, I might, this is totally blanking. Oh yeah, Beauty Strike, sorry. Um, but these are all local businesses that also should be supported at the same time and like local initiatives, you know, and like working within our networks to be intentional because one thing that I was really observant of this year was that people, like you were saying, Sachi, like being, just giving when you have nothing to give at all. Like I was literally giving people the shirt off my back when no one even asked for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so why deplete my resources? Why give myself all of this just like dive into my work. It just kind of felt like I was running around my head cut off. And then I had a conversation with Leanne from Cafe Forsaken about their operation and everything. And it started to make sense that like everybody was burning out. And I completely felt burnt out at the end of January where I was kind of just so exhausted. I needed to take a break in order to reorganize again. And it made me now put in an intention that like, I'm going to create things with intention and only if we need it and not just because I'm just like so desperate to just give, 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 give. I think that there has to be this large amount of concise like admiration and dedication to put into this work in order to yield to an output that is actually favorable. And also like just because you're handing something out, it doesn't mean someone wants it. You know what I'm saying? Like that's one thing that I've seen a lot of the time where people, especially through our fridge programs, are putting in food that's expired, putting in ready-made food that like are hot from a kitchen and just popping it into the fridge and like First of all, that's like food food ethics 101. You don't do that. And just like having a lack of information of food and actual food justice work and knowledge and just thinking that they're doing something to just like, you know, fix a problem. Community fridges, as well as this, all these other initiatives are not going to end these issues. It'll just bring visibility to it. And I think that's what, where this whole thing starts is coronavirus made us very, made everything really transparent this year. This last administration made super, everything super transparent. Where do we work with transparency now? Now that everything's super transparent, how do we use these things to actually make sure that everything that we need for our community is given to them, you know? So. Absolutely. I mean, for me in the work that I found myself doing, I think that's all that I can ask for, you know, just the, the full transparency, but also like, okay, you're seeing, you, you people have to be willing to learn, you know, and for, for each of us coming, I think that that one thing that's sticking with me is that um, that found family familial support, but also coming from service backgrounds, like not having a lot to give and then, and then feeling fueled by our work through giving, I feel like is, is something I've yet to, to figure out. It's just so kind of interesting to me. Like I felt way more burnt out when I had a desk job. I was working, you know, in studios and having in fine art and just, having this intense like okay like I'm doing I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing I'm making my parents proud you know I put a lot of effort into getting a degree I had to drop out of school and those those kinds of things like all of it feels like the the typical things that should be stacked behind us and offering us an opportunity to succeed are kind of stacked against us and yet you know the extension and offer to continue support for our communities is is it's just a self-fueling machine it feels like um, you know, to see a smile on someone's face when they have a nice meal or a warm meal, like people come into the kitchen where I volunteer quite often and, and I'm, I'm putting the faces to the mouths that I'm, I'm feeding, you know, when I'm in there, I'm kind of head down producing meals, but it's, it's pretty satisfying to hear that from people. And, um, and so now I really want to hear about two things from each of you before we, um, go our separate ways. And that is one long-term goal for your organization to accomplish um, this year because it's a fresh year and, and we have no idea what is in the plot for um, the US pandemic 2021, but um, you know something that you're looking forward to. And additionally, um, I want to hear how you can be, supported in reaching that goal for this year. I think it's good to voice like what you need. Let's put it out there. Let's ask for support. Um, I wanna know what public assistance is working on. Um, well, I mean, I think our long-term goals for like this year and honestly a little bit beyond is just like to continue our youth mural program. Uh, we have some coming up in the spring and the fall, just like from local businesses in the neighborhood who are just 
so happy to have us in the neighborhood and they're so excited about us and like the youth is really excited to they're I mean they're amazing kids and like they are just really eager to just like be a part of it and like it's just it's so like heartwarming to see them like in the space and just like working and like there is really great um also we want to like our in-house production is growing so like we really I mean everyone there really comes from like an art background so like we are we're trying to use that and like grow with that too so like we were looking to like create more media I mean like we're already like we've been shooting like music videos for each other and like just all kinds of content and like we want to continue doing that so like I mean I think like a lot of what we want to do is like we even want to like start making like tv and like just like pretty much anything that involves production um, for media. And then also, I mean, I just, we're just like open to like any idea that anyone has that they think that we can help um, with. And like, do you have an idea for some type of programming, like approach us and we'll consider it or like see if we can help you with it. Um, I think also we want to eventually have land upstate so we can um, have residencies and like just also a place to like for anyone in our community to just like get away and also just to like grow our own produce and like have that and like um yeah I just yeah. that sounds beautiful like a, a wonderful oasis upstate with all of the public <laughs> yeah um uh last that I was in touch, you you guys were looking for community, like a headquarters. Are you still searching for that? Yes, 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 yes. So that's our like biggest thing where we are looking to be supported. We have, right now we're like currently facing um, an eviction in our current Crown Heights location. Um, we've started to go fund me and our goal is to raise um, $500,000, not more to secure um, a headquarters and we'd like to stay in Crown Heights. Um, but like, yeah, we want to secure a new space, but also like have adequate funding to like continue our programming and like sustain our community. Um, yeah, I also like it, if anyone that we know like has a space in Crown Heights or like in Brooklyn that they're willing to even give us, like that would be even more amazing. I think we have, we just have a lot of we just need a lot of space where we can work, where we can paint banners, murals, um, work on our bikes um, and have our like design lab in, keep our art supplies, our apothecary supplies, outdoor space is really important to us too. Um, and like enough space to like have for like lounging and resting because that's a collective resting is like also really, really important to us. And I think it should be important to everybody too because it's, gotta take a break sometimes <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely agreed I think rest is radical yeah um Isaac what's on the menu for friend of a friend yeah with that rest is radical I think uh um that makes me think of something I was going to bring up in our next meeting um just figuring out a place where our community can shower <laughs> would be uh, like revelatory it's such a such a um it's just so um infuriating to hear about uh the shelters and how they treat that um super dehumanizing so um yeah if anyone in <laughs> it, it lives in like the wall street lower manhattan area could help us um with that issue i'm gonna say to keep me honest that's our year goal I'm going to say that for all a friend of a friend. Um, yeah. um, are there any other immediate needs for your community? I know you just wrapped up a clothing drive. Are you still accepting clothing donations? Yeah, we always accept clothing donations, um, but only like larger stuff that fits our community, like uh, coats and like men's coats um bigger pants yeah um because yeah so we're still doing that if people want to drop those off at the eight ball space that would be amazing too boots bigger boots like nine and above 
are helpful. Um, yeah. And Thank what are the drop-off location for those things? Sorry? Could you share the drop-off location for those things just for our audience? Yes, it's the uh, Eight Ball Community Center on uh, 59th East 4th Street, seventh floor, buzzer number 14. We take them, uh, usually we got someone in the space Thursdays, noon to six, and Sundays, three to six. Um, yeah, thanks guys. And Zanat, what is, what is um, Playground looking forward to this year? So we built a greenhouse a few months ago. Um, our harvest starts in March, which is as soon as I get back. So hopefully we'll have produce to throw in the fridges that we've been supporting for the last few months. And then aside from that, we also are planning, we do a block party every year. And last year we did one that's socially distanced and it was really responsible and everybody had a great time. So hopefully we can do it again. Um, just being able to just like provide through um, you know, I think we're hoping to at least become a site to get people tested because mobile testing sites are now available. So I think we'll be able to at least dispatch them at our location at a few times a week. And, you know, aside from that, just having um, a connection to all of the other amazing collectives that do work. I just want to be able to grow our network. because I think that's ultimately what this is about. And, you know, we want to be here for the long haul. Um, and so we're raising $100,000 for our for our year to make sure to support all the initiatives that we've started um, prior to COVID and during COVID. And we have a GoFundMe if anybody wants to donate. We're almost, we're halfway there right now. So get us home. That's, so we got 50K more to go for yes. Playground. We're gonna multiply that by 10 for public assistance. assistance. We'll get some showers going for friend of a friend. <laughs> <laughs> 